Um, the title of my talk is um, Scalable Secure Scuttlebutt. Um, my name, and my name's Dominic Tarr. Um, so what is Scuttlebutt? So Scuttlebutt, um, the ter so, uh, so Scuttlebutt is a nautical term for gossip. Uh, a butt is a barrel that water is stored in and scuttle is to open the barrel. So it's to make a hole in it. So this why scuttle is also to sink a ship because you open the, the ship. So um, the, yeah, so, so this means gossip for pirates and stuff like this. So, uh, and the t I got the term from um, a part of the Amazon paper. There was an uh, Amazon paper called Flow Control for Anti-Entropy Projects. It's like for anti-entropy protocols. So it's eventually consistent gossip protocol that's used within a trusted system. Um, and then I made secure scuttlebutt, which took the same idea and then added security. So um, the peer, uh, the ID of the peer is the of it is its public key. Uh, the data model is just append-only logs, where each uh, peer appends to it, has its own personal log that's signed. Um, peers can relay other messages, but they can't insert, modify, or reorder messages because the signatures would then be invalid. So um, this gives you uh, like a really simple data model that can use to re-represent a bunch of stuff, but it's, and it's completely like free to run. Like signatures, uh, you can make 12, you know, thousands of signatures a second on an ordinary laptop. You can, the current implementation can receive like 2,000 messages a second at, um, and validate them. Like it's, it's very, like, it's not, it avoids all kinds of bottlenecks that you do if you have a, get if you have a consensus layer. Um, so this, then there's a few, it maps quite closely to um, social media kind of models like um, um, Twitter and whatnot because you, you follow the feeds that you want to replicate and this solves a whole bunch of neat problems. So this solves a civil attack because the human, it bubbles up to the human layer and then they just unfollow the nodes they don't want to talk to um, or don't want to hear from. Um, it also provides discovery, so writing a, a crappy peer-to-peer -peer Google would be really, really hard, but writing a, um, a crappy peer-to-peer -peer social network um, actually can still be really awesome if there are awesome people on it. Um, and you can still discover new things, so it's a way of like discovering things in a decentralized way. And then because it replicates messages in order, um, it's easy to think about building a database on top of this because the um, things happen, you receive things in the same order that they happened. So that was secure scuttlebutt. And then my recent work has been to make it much, much more scalable. So scalable secure scuttlebutt is the same thing again, but optimized for bandwidth and latency. Um, so the, the big deal here is that the overhead, the networking overhead is proportional to the feeds updated. And I'll explain why that's important. So, um, so part one is um, the optimizing the network topology. So the, um, the like simplest, most naive design would be just to connect to everyone. Um, and I had a really cool animation of this that you can't see, um, but perhaps I'll just like, I don't know, can see, you wanna see something kind of happening? Yep. Um, so this of course is like inherently centralized. It goes out from one point, but it's actually really efficient because each um, message is transmitted exactly once to, to every node. So the amount of people that receive messages is exactly the same as the amount of messages that, need to be, that are sent. And, um, but the problem is this means that actually there's one node that does all the work and all the other nodes do nearly no work. And then, you know, that's, you know, you know about, you know about why centralization is bad. So another solution is you just have a random network, just pairs, every peer connects to a couple of other random nodes. And it's really easy to make a fully connected network like this. Like if you connect to more than two peers, two other peers, the chance of being completely connected is like, it, as the network gets bigger, it increases. So once you pass two, it's like the chance of being fully connected is like pretty much certain. And, um, but the problem is that it's a trade-off between um, bandwidth and latency depending on how many extra connections you have. So I have another animation here. So um, it's like looks like a noisy a noisy mess, and then you might see some like red 
um, the, all the red messages that are flying around, those are the extra redundant messages. And um, if you have like, I think this one has like five connections or something. I've got a little table here. Yeah, so once you have like five connections per, uh, per things, then you're getting like 10 times extra redundant messages that you don't need to send. Well, you kind of need to send to make sure they all arrive, but you've sent 10 times as much as you needed to. But it's super robust. Um, the simple, and it's, the, and it's super simple to implement as well. The role is just um, send new messages to everyone that didn't send it to you. Um, which is also mean don't resend messages you already know. So just when you receive a message, check if you already know about this message, and if not, send it to everyone that you're connected to. And then that will flood the whole network um, pretty efficiently, like very robustly. Like if some nodes get taken out, it'll just be routed around other ways. So um, there's only like a couple of cases where you need to hand, think of here is like um, one peer sends it to another peer, or the second peer sends it to the first peer, and the other thing that can happen is they both send it to each other where there are two paths for that message to get to, to Alice and to Bob and they both received it in a, within the time that it takes to send, to send one message. Um, that's, the, that's the only case where you get both peers um, passing the message where you get, where you get a redundant connection. Um, and the bandwidth complexity is like it's proportional to the messages um, times the spanning connections um, plus twice the redundant connections because each redundant connection gets two messages sent on it. So the redundant connections are like much more expensive than the minimal set of spanning connections. Um, and once you've got ten, once you, when you've got ten connections to other, per pair, you have like ninety-five percent redundant messages. So that means if we can get rid of the redundant messages. We can, we can, um, we can just transmit one uh, message, one one message per pair, which is op optimal. So, the better solution is a spanning tree network. So, a spanning tree is like we get a, a graph, and we just only have the connections we need to reach all of the nodes. Um, so, we can take the flooding gossip, and we can build use that to build a spanning network, a spanning network in a decentralized way by um, just whenever you receive a duplicate message, you just, say, you just deactivate that connection. But I didn't say disconnect, and I'll come back to that in a bit. So you just deactivate that. So now you're sending like um, just the number of messages. Um, the only problem is that trees are really fragile. Um, so Because now you've basically just added a whole bunch of single, you've made every single node into a central point of failure. So there's one path between any two random nodes, and if any of the nodes in that thing fail, then the um, then those messages won't get through. So the um, yeah, so it's bandwidth optimal, but it's not robust. Um, but then there's this paper I discovered a while ago called uh, epidemic broadcast trees, and this um, combines the best parts of both flood and gossip and um, spanning trees. So uh, how it works basically is you have the connections are in two modes, there's eager and there's lazy. And a so the, lazy, the, the redundant connections get put into lazy mode. So in um, eager mode, when you receive a message, you transmit it immediately. And when a connection is in lazy mode, um, when you receive a message, you just send a really short note that you know about this new message now. So all of the main, all of the spanning connections get the whole message sent across it. So that's, that lets the message propagate as um, fast as it can. And then the message, the redundant connections, they just have a very, a very short message being sent across. So it might only be, um, so in the current implementation of Secure Scuttlebutt, the, um, and the average message size is like 700 bytes, and it can be, could be go up to eight kilobytes, but the note would only be like 80 bytes, I think, and that could be like binary optimized down to probably less than 10. So the redundant connections still exist, but you just need to way a starter on them. And then um, they also, the robustness still exists because 
when um, a message, when so when you receive um, a message for the first time, you like rebroadcast it and so on. But if you receive a note about a message that you haven't, that you don't know about yet, then you send a you send a request back to that, um, back to that, um, back back to that peer, asking them to turn back into eager mode, and then they'll send you the whole message. And now the network is repaired. So, as the best of both worlds. Um, yeah, and then there's only a small amount of state that you need to um, keep track of per peer for per feed. You just need the, the ID, the local sequence number, the remote sequence number, the local request, the remote request, and the local and remote modes. So that's only um, that's you know we're under like depending on how long the ID string is, um, we're talking about like just like tens of bytes. Um, that is um, one, okay. So then um, the other, so that's, that's all about optimizing the network. So the second part is um, optimizing the handshakes. So Secure Scuttlebutt had this, um, so original Scuttlebutt had this thing called a vector clock. So a vector clock is just like a list of all of the things um, so per so you have a whole bunch of whole bunch of friends, and when two friends bump into each other, they say, "Oh, when did you last hear from Bob? I heard from Bob on Tuesday. When did you last hear, hear from Alice? I heard from Alice on Monday." And if I say that I saw Alice on Monday and you saw her on Sunday, then I can then I know I just need to send you the messages from Monday, um, well from after Sunday. So it means we just exchange this one thing, and um, then I just know immediately what you don't have. And by arranging the messages in a linear order, order it makes that comparison like completely simple. Um, if you have like more complicated orderings, and like if you have some kind of comp more complicated structure, it becomes much, much more difficult to do a, a remote set comparison. But if you have it in a linear order, it's like dead simple. So just like um, compromise towards the simpler structure that's easier to be optimal about. Um, so that, but that has a problem in that if you're having, like the original paper that describes this said that it probably, you know, it was designed for, used for a, one cluster within a data center. So you'd have like a DynamoDB instance that they said might have like 300 nodes, which is maybe a lot for one, you know, cluster in a, da in a data center, but it's not a lot for a peer-to-peer -peer network. We want to have thousands and thousands of nodes. So if you have thousands and thousands of nodes, then just sending the vector clock like really adds up. Um, because you might, it might just be like a public key and a sequence number, so that might be like 80 bytes, but then if you're sending this for like 3,000 people, um, that is like into like hundreds of kilobytes, so that means like each time you connect, you, send, you might send like half a megabyte of data both ways, and if you can reconnect and reconnect, you could be sending like tens of megabytes a day um, just to keep the network alive, like even if no messages are being sent. So that's not really, that's not very good at all. But um, one of the other Secure Scuttlebutt contributors, um, uh, Sal, Charles Lenher, came up with this, this idea to um, skip some requests. So what you do is you just remember the vector clock that the other person sent you, and then compare your new vector clock to the stored one for that peer, and then just don't mention all the things that haven't changed. So if, I, um, if we meet on Sunday and we exchange news about Carol, and then we meet each other again on Wednesday, and neither of us has ta have talked to Carol since then, then we just don't mention Carol. And because we know that if, so if the other person did, they would mention her. So that means that you can just leave out most of the vector clock and you just don't mention most of the things that have changed, that all the things that you think probably haven't changed. And then if you find out, if some if the other person does mention it, then you just reply with like the, your partial um, vector clock of the things that that didn't um, didn't change. Um, yeah. So I had. Um, Yeah, and you know, this is this is this is really important because 
when when you have like uh, people using um, any pretty much any kind of application, um, you, power laws are really typical. So you're really likely to have some users that are like really active, um, you know, um, use every day or posting every, you know constantly. Um, you'll have like some users that are like daily, a fair amount of like moderate users, and then like heaps and heaps of like people that only use it occasionally or even signed up and never used it again. And you don't want to be wasting bandwidth on people that haven't done anything in a while. So this stra this simple technique allows you to completely cut out um, all of that stuff. And that basically gives you, in the end, so basic, um, basic scuttlebutt, the message overhead per connection was like the messages plus the feeds. And if no messages have changed, the messages might be zero, but feeds could be thousands. But secure scuttlebutt is messages plus updated feeds. And updated feeds could be a much, much smaller number. Usually it would be, like if you reconnect frequent, like frequently, the number could be will be close to zero. Um, if you reconnect months later, it will just be, um, you might get, individual users might have posted hundreds of messages, but the overhead is just one for that updated feed, um, which makes reconnections very cheap. Um, the only time you have to pay the whole, um, send all of the feeds is when you have a, um, when, you, when the first time the two pairs connect. Um, yeah, so that's very good. And the, lat and the latency um, complexity is just, um, you can, you're replicating in either one or two round trips. So one round trip, if you've, said, if you've sent the whole clock and they then send the messages, but if they send a part, if they, or if they don't, or if the messages that you haven't mentioned haven't updated, then it's one round trip. And if you send a message, if you send a partial vector, if they send a partial vector clock and then you have to send one back, then it's two round trips. But my, um, so some um, background since now basically improvising. Um, so like I became interested in this because I was li living on a sailboat in New Zealand and um, I was used to like, like my, my normal thing was not having very good internet. At the time, at the first, when I first became interested in this, I didn't actually have any, any internet in my boat. And um, I was like, why can't that be, like why does that mean that I can't use my computer? Like you should be able to use your computer. I also grew up on a farm in New Zealand where the best internet we, we had was like a satellite internet that had like a one second round trip, um, which is like, you know, it shouldn't really take that long, that long, that long for light to travel, but it has uh, like, I don't know, lots of switching packets and that sort of stuff. So I was really determined to, um, like latency is really a killer. Like if you, are in, if you live in like a fancy place that has fiber and that sort of stuff, then latency, you might not be able to notice it and a couple of extra round trips might not be that bad. But when latency gets bad, it gets really bad. And if you have a, a design with that sends a lot of packets back and forth, then it's gonna be really, really painful to use in that situation. So I was determined to have like a constant number of round trips. So one or two round trips, I think is like about how much you can, t I can tolerate for a replication protocol. Um, logarithmic round trips, not, not acceptable. That's gonna be really painful um, in, in many cases. Um, so, the part three is, um, I'm glad they've arrived, uh, comparison to IPFS. I was sure people would ask, ask about this. So um, secure scuttlebutt basically optimizes for the worst case in, in IPFS. So um, secure scuttlebutt is designed for like long append-only chains, and this would be like the pathological case in IPFS. So they're trying to do completely, completely opposite things. Um, but similar in that they both replicate data without global consistency. So they're kind of like an infrastructural role for if you're building like other peer-to-peer -peer apps and so on. So neither, again, neither have any like cryptocurrency or thing like di directly built into it. But if you're building stuff like that, you could move your data around using a combination of these things. Um, Secure Scuttlebutt streams updates in order per feed, and IPFS ha has it pointed to the latest message and works back, and if you want it to have it relatively efficient, you'd have some kind of tree or some sort of directory where you find the things, or just not have 
very deep structures have relatively shallow ones. Um, so IPFS is probably better for like arbitrary partial data sets like wikis and uh, sort of static sites, such things, or like um, directories of data and that sort of stuff. Whereas SSB is designed specifically for like social applications or social applications with something strapped on the side. Um, so Secure Scuttlebutt is basically a graph database and IPFS is a file system. Um, yep, okay, um, that took less long because I didn't get to show you the animation stuff, but um, I'm, that, that's it. Okay, um, if you'd like to, if you'd like to uh, learn more, um, you can go to uh, scuttlebutt.nz, uh, that's two Ts, and um, github.com slash ssbc slash patchwork, there's like a, a UI for like a real, real working application that you can use today. Um, and if you go on that, you'll meet lots of, lo lo lots of, lo lots of lovely people that will tell you all about um, how things work. Uh, fortunately, yeah, sorry the slides didn't work. Um, Got, still got eight minutes. Any questions or heckling or anything? Uh, scuttlebutt.nz. Yep. Cool. Thank you very much. <laughs>